everybody, this is Scott Smith, and I'm here at Lamp Light Farms with my good friend and buddy, Tom Lample, who's going to show us today how to extract honey from a privately owned honey hive, beehive. So, with no further to do, let me uh, introduce you to Tom Lample. Hello. <laughs> so, what's the process like, Tom? Uh, it's fairly simple. We've taken the boxes off of the hives already uh, with the frames full of honey. They're capped off. We want to make sure that the honey's dry enough and ready to uh, be extracted. And it's easy enough to check that if they're not capped. Um, you can shake the frame. And if it falls out of the frame, it's not dry enough yet. Um, it's still in the nectar form. And uh, if it's capped, it's, it's ready. Um, so you know that and you can pull the frames off. And I've already done that. I've got a stack of boxes over here ready to go. And the next step in the process to uncap the uh, frames. So we're going to take the wax cappings off of all the cells that are full of ripe honey. And uh, we'll take those frames then and we'll put them in this radial extractor. Um, and it spins it. And basically we'll throw the honey out of the cells and into the sides of the machine. And we'll drain down and then we've got a gate valve down here that we can drain it off into buckets. And we just coarse filter our honey. We want the uh, the pollen and all the the good stuff to be left in it. So if you uh, highly filter the honey, you lose all that. So okay. ours is considered raw local honey. So for those people interested at home who would like to uh, maybe uh, have their own hive, what's the cost just to get started with a, 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 a beginner beginner beehive it, set? It's fairly steep. It adds up quickly. Um, it sounds cheap enough, but when you get started uh, for a full um, hive ready to produce honey, you're looking at $400 uh, and, and the boxes and the frames. And that's just the basics. And you need a smoker and a suit and hive tools. And uh, if you don't have extracting equipment, you're going to be looking at cutting your comb out and uh, maybe squeezing it. Do you uh, think maybe we'd be able to show the manual way to do this on one or two? Um, I don't have a uh, manual extractor. It basically, it would be the same thing here um, with a hand crank. I see. They've okay. got that one. Or you can just take it and put it in cheesecloth and just squeeze it. And uh, wax will be retained in the cheesecloth and the honey drains out. For somebody just getting started, what would be the uh, volume that they could expect from one um, hive? Uh, if you're just getting started, I would suggest probably the first year you're not going to take anything. You're going to leave it all for the bees. Um, if you're lucky in the second year, you know, it just depends on the season. You could get, you know, 40 pounds um, off your hive or more. Um, but the weather, it's just like farming. Um, it's dependent on the weather. You get a really dry year or too wet of a spring and you lose your nectar flow and, and uh, there's just no production. This has been a tremendous year. So this is my second time pulling honey, and I've got a third to go yet. Okay, so what's the most honey you've ever pulled from one comb? Uh, one hive, the uh, my third hive down in this stack, I think I've pulled six medium um, supers off of that one this year, and that's about 40 pounds per super. So that's a bunch. It's been the biggest producer of my whole yard. And just as an average, what does honey sell for at this point in time? Um, somewhere between um, 8 and $10 a pound is the, the going rate. Okay, guys. Well, you heard it from the master, so we're going to watch this process. Stay tuned. We do all the cutting, and he feeds the... Yeah, uh, so tell extractor. What you're doing right now, Tom. I'm just cutting the caps off these cells um, to release the honey that's stored inside. And uh, and so each of these cells would be there would be several of these located in each hive. Is that correct? Yeah, these frames. Um, there's about now well, deep frames got two thousand cells per side. Is that right? I think. And uh, these are medium frames. They're just a little bit easier to handle for the beekeeper. Um, the deep frames can get really heavy and uh, hard to handle. So these are a, a little bit more manageable. Come on now. I got to get a bigger lean there, Dad, so they'll roll those cappings. 
There it goes. And so what do you do with the wax that's left over? Is there a purpose for that or use? Oh, yeah, you can, uh, lots of things. You can uh, give it back to the bees um, in the form of foundation. Make your own foundation to give back to them so they'll fill this back up. Um, the other thing you can do is, uh, get that piece ready to head. Um, people make salves, candles. Um, we're thinking about experimenting with, uh, making a salve with a plantain, a plant from the yard, and trying out a plantain is real effective. If you chew it up and put it on a bee sting or a mosquito bite, um, it takes the pain out of it almost immediately. We were thinking, well, maybe we can combine the two and make a wax salve of some sort, so that might be a winter experiment. We'll see. See if that uh, pans out or not. And how long have you and your father been um, working bees? Six, seven years now. Um, we had, uh, we grow a garden usually, and uh, we didn't have any bees on our plants one year. We noticed that we had really nice green bean plants and no bees. And uh, we uh, decided to get a hive to see if that was a problem with pollination. We got one hive, and uh, sure enough, that was, that was the problem. Because the uh, very next season, I had garbage bags full of <laughs> full of stuff, and uh, ever since then, we've been keeping bees. And that first few years, I lost everything. Um, there's a steep learning curve on uh, keeping bees, so we lost highs for the first several years. Um, every winter, basically, I would have to start over again the next year. And uh, I finally, through just contacts and talking to people, found some mentors that kind of helped guide me and got me started uh, in doing a better job of keeping my bees and watching their health. They're very susceptible to mites and winter starvation and all kinds of things that uh, can take them out. So learned over time that how to do it, and we've been having some decent success since then. Now, we're here in the Oxford area, Oxford, Ohio, and I know there are some local clubs oh, um, yeah. around here. Do you participate w with any of those clubs, or would you? do you have any that you would recommend anybody? Uh, the Southwestern Ohio Beekeepers Association at Oxford, um, they meet uh, first Thursday of the month, I think. I started out there, and... Uh, they're, they do a lot of the stuff to get people started, the basic beekeeping. And uh, Alex Zomchek, the guy in charge, uh, the club president, he's very knowledgeable. He does artificial insemination and all that kind of stuff. And um, I've kind of expanded beyond the club now. Um, I'm working with other people now and selling nukes and actually helping people with their highs. Okay, we've uh, put four four uncapped frames and this is a radial extractor and uh, we stepped up to the, uh, the electric model because uh, we didn't want to hand crank and uh, basically it's got a um, variable speed so you can adjust your uh, adjust your speed it's uh, supposed to be a tangential extractor which means you can put the frames in um, on an angle but we found it doesn't work very well that way so we do them flat We'll extract them, it throws the honey to the outside of the frame, then we flip them. So it works like a centrifuge? You know? Correct. Correct. And so there's, a, there. there's a, a honey comb that has yeah. got the honey extractor. Yep, you can see it's all out of that side. When you flip it over, you'll see how it's still full on this side. What I'll do with these frames then is uh, I'll take these empty wax frames, I'll put them back in boxes, and I'll give these back to the bees, and they'll clean them up. And uh, they'll actually use them next year, but they'll clean all the little bits of honey out of it and reuse that. So none of it goes to waste. And then all the stuff that I've cut, we'll save that and we can squeeze the honey that we've missed out of that. And uh, then we can sell wax bars or make salves or whatever we want to do, lip balms a lot of people do. But you can see how this kind of just slowly builds up speed. 
you don't want to just blast it because you can throw the comb right out of the frame. So you come up slowly because they're usually not balanced perfectly. And I imagine they're fairly fragile too, correct? Correct. So I see that at the um, bottom of your unit here, you've got a uh, bucket set up and what looks like a, uh, a drain of some sort. Is that where the honey is going to be extracted from? Correct. That's a gate valve, and we'll let this fill up a little bit. The extra weight actually helps balance the machine. But once it starts to get too full and get into the bottom of the frames that are spinning, we'll start draining the honey out. And will it need to go through any other sort of uh, filtration process before it's uh, edible? Um, it doesn't have to. I mean, you can eat it right now, but we want to make sure there's no legs, wings, um, big chunks of wax, anything like that in the honey. So we'll uh, coarse filter it. So that's the filter? Correct. Yep, just a coarse filter. Local honey um, isn't, isn't compared to the stuff you get at the grocery store. You're going to find that it's going to be more expensive. Um, one, there's a lot more labor in it. Um, and two, it, uh, it's local. It doesn't come from China, so they can get it really cheaply. The problem with stuff from other countries, a lot of times it's laced with chemicals. And also they mix it with corn syrup. They adulterate it with other sugars and water it or thin it down and uh, generally they pasteurize it too so that it uh, stays flowable it'll keep pouring no matter what um, local honey is usually not pasteurized um, it's all 100 percent honey and uh, what will happen a lot of times is it crystallizes it'll get solid in the jar it'll go back to its crystalline sugar form and people think it's gone bad well honey never goes bad they found honey in the pyramids it was crystallized, but it was still good. And they actually could look and find pollen grains from plants in it from back to that time. So it doesn't go bad. Um, it just crystallizes, and all you have to do is just uh, put it in a pan of water and gently warm it. And it'll melt right back out and turn right back into its natural form. And that's the way you retain all the good bacteria and pollens and all that stuff in it without destroying it. If you microwave it or superheat it, that destroys all that. So... Don't be afraid of honey that's crystallized. Just gently warm it. It'll come right back. Um, I kind of like it when it gets a little bit crystallized. It's kind of in between the two. You can spread it on toast and it doesn't run off. So it'll last for quite a while. You can see some of the pollen in here. I don't know if you can see that or not. These, these little dark spots in here, those are pollen. And that's where that was filled up with pollen. And that'll, that'll end up getting mixed in with our honey, which is why people like to use honey to treat allergies. They have pollen allergies. Um, so by take that bodies maybe I'm yeah, assuming. Yeah, build up a tolerance for it by uh, by taking a small dose every day, putting a teaspoonful or a tablespoonful in your honey or your coffee. You kind of build a natural immunity over time, and it can help treat yourself for allergies. Um, people usually use it for their pets. If you got a dog that lays out in the grass a lot or something and gets uh, hot spots or anything like that, you can you can give them honey. Okay. Um, now, one thing you don't want to do is give an infant honey. Um, babies, that's, uh, I think they say two years of age before they eat honey, or you can give a kid honey, because um, it can make them sick because of the, the uh, natural bacteria and stuff in it. So that's just a caution. But Good to know. This will just uh, filter out the wax cappings that we've missed, and... Uh, that's about it. It lets all the pollen through and everything. That's the best way to do it. It leaves all the good nutrients and everything you want in it. And then we just raw pack it in jars. We can show you that process here in a little while. We'll, we'll get done here. I've got some in the house that's, that's done. I'll show you how it jars the up. Yeah, it's coming out the bottom into that bucket. That'll, that'll be the finished. But yeah, it's you can uh, you can stick your finger in there and eat it right now. So okay. actually, as far as harvesting goes, it's a very simple process. There's really nothing. Yeah, there. just no, hot, nothing. hot and time consuming. That's it. And this process, you know, you're. you're Harvesting honey, but there is a 
a real benefit that you're raising the bees and keeping them going. Now, do you um, do you follow the? Uh, so I understand that you you're cognizant of the uh, uh, issue with, with bees being in peril. What about the, the monarch butterflies? Do you, uh, I suppose that because of the lack of native uh, wildflowers, that they're in the state of peril. And so, what what's causing this peril? To the best of my Probably herbicides. Uh, of wildflowers and, and crops. Now they plant corn or soybeans or wheat. And what's the remedy? Small farming. You know, small family farms with hedgerows, and you know they cut all the hedgerows out now, and to get an extra acre of ground in. And I don't know. I'm no expert. Farmers are just doing the best they can to make a living for their family. You know, they're doing what they got to do to maximize their crops and their their profits okay folks so there you have it you lean life hackers uh, if you're interested in becoming a beekeeper and starting your own hive making your own honey maybe uh selling it for a profit this is uh the the slim line version of how to do just that tom i want to thank you for the uh, opportunity to pick your brain and see your operation and for the information that you've given us uh, you know, one thing I will say, and I was talking to Tom about this a minute ago, is uh, honey and, and, and bees, even though maybe you don't think about them much, are, are a very important uh, factor when it comes to the ecology. As a matter of fact, they're so important that, that uh, if you're a, a Christian or a believer in the Bible, you'll even remember that God had said that he was taking his people to the land of milk and honey. So obviously, uh, God sees honey and, and the bees that make it as a reward and something probably that's to be um, uh, attained and, and, and treasured. Do you have any, any parting thoughts, Tom, or anything to tell any of our uh, viewers uh, as far as what, uh, what the, the aspect of trying to maybe take this up as a hobby would be? Um, just be patient. Um, if you're going to do this, it's going to be a learning experience. I would suggest maybe doing some research for a few months before you just dive in. Um, find a good mentor, um, somebody local that's willing to work with you, come over and help do hive inspections, things of that nature. And uh, don't start with just one hive. If you're going to get into it, probably start with about three. Um, that way you've got a, a little bit of a diversity because they're going to all be a little bit different and uh, you've got a lot better chance of uh, getting through the winter, surviving the winter with three hives. Um, if you just have one, all your eggs are in one basket and it's it can be difficult. I, I lost all of them many years. Well, there you have it, folks, right from the uh, beekeeper's mouth. This is Scott Smith. We're out.